two video lectures this week. Okay, so given that, let's start right away. This is my Timex database, which I already have shared with you guys. The first version contains all the tables in singular form and the new version contains the tables in plural form. Don't be confused by the fact that I have them all into the same database. I just need to be able to have all of them so that I can have it backward compatible to my first version. So if you take a look at the department, the first version, you will see that it has department code as the primary key with two letters and then the name of the department. But departments, which is the second version, has three fields. It has the ID, which is now numerical, um, sequential, automatically created by the database, with the name and then a state. Similarly, there are changes between employee and employees and timesheet and timesheets and I didn't have any payments on the first version. So don't worry if um, you know what I'm just gonna yeah, I'm just gonna leave them. Okay so let's start right away into creating our project. So like I said, I'm going to be doing this from scratch. So I'm going to create a brand new project. Just as if I'm just starting to create my database project. I'm sorry, my uh, web project. So it's going to be a new project. It's going to be a web, dynamic web project. And I'm going to call it has to be something different than what I've used so far. Timex um, Auto Web. So this project will almost have almost everything will be automatically generated from the database. Okay, I'm gonna target the runtime to be Apache Tomcat 6.0, which that means that the uh, web module will be 2.5 version and I just keep the rest of the stuff by default. So I finish and it should create my Timex Auto Web. Here it is. If you guys take a look at the structure of the project, it should have a web content. This is where most of the static content will go whether it's HTML or JSPs with very little um, server-side code. Inside web content you will find the web inf. The web inf is the folder that will contain configuration information that is web informational for Tomcat where it's going to run, our, ser our web server where this project will be running. And then under the web inf you will find libraries the library folder. This is where you would put all your jars and dependencies and the famous web XML. At this point you should already know what the web XML is. It's a deployment and descriptor. You can see it directly in a structural way or you can see it as an XML way. Or there's a third way of looking at it. In Eclipse you can look at it from within the project deployment descriptor. Okay. Typically the display name will be the same name as the project and this is something that it's going to be very important down the road when we include Spring because in Spring you also have to have the same display name as the project. So as I was saying the deployment descriptor tells you all the different sections that it has. So right now it only has one section, the welcome pages, which are these 
index, etc., etc. At this point, we do not care about the welcome pages except for one, the index JSP. So I'm going to get rid of all these. I cannot get rid of those from there. Okay, so I'll get rid of them from here. And I'm just I'm just gonna leave the index dot JSP as the only welcome. Okay. This should be this index dot JSP should be the very first Java server page that you turn in two or three weeks ago, which is your home page. Okay. I am not going to create it from scratch, obviously, because that will be very lengthy. So I'm just going to copy the one that I have from Timex Web. Web content, paste, and there is my index JSP. Okay. Um, what else? Under Java resources, under the source for, under the source package, and we're going to change that. That's where all the packages go. Okay, all the Java code goes. So the next thing that we need is to include all the jars that are going to allow us to use in our project frameworks like Hibernate, like Spring. <coughs> also MySQL, database, all that stuff. So we're going to have to copy, and I suggest you copy, literally copy into the lib folder under the WebIn folder, copy all the jars that your project is going to need in order to run. So you're going to, you can do it from here, from within Eclipse or from the file system, it's up to you. It's all the same. You copy and then you paste. <coughs> all your life. So at this point, if you right click on Timex Auto Web and go to the build path and configure the build path, you should see all these libraries Apache Tomcat. That's the one that allows us to run and deploy in our server Tomcat. The ear libraries, those are the enterprise type of libraries that allows us to do um, servlets and stuff. The JRE, that's pretty much the Java standard library, the ones that uh, that knows what Java looks like. And then the web app libraries. The web app libraries are all the libraries that we just included. So as you can see, um, log4j is there, which would allow us to log, to do the logging. My SQL connector, 5.0 version, 5.04, that's the one that I have. Um, also, Hibernate 3, that's the one that we're going to be using today to do the uh, the um, object relational mapping to our database. And also later on in the second video lecture, we're going to see the spring, <coughs> the spring uh, side of the project. OK, so now we're ready to generate our entity classes and our hibernate mappings. So what we did last week is we Make sure that we were in the Hibernate perspective. So we switched to the Hibernate perspective. This Hibernate perspective gives us uh, additional views like Hibernate Query Result, Hibernate Dynamic SQL Preview, also Hibernate Configurations, stuff like that that is not available on the other perspectives. And, and so we right-click on Timex Auto web or project and then we're going to create our new what is it console configuration no our 
hibernate configuration. Correct? And then we're going to put it under the source. Um, under this, wait a minute. Do we have to create the packages first? I think we have to create the packages first. Um, so under source, I'm going to create a new package. So before we go into the Hibernate world, let's make sure that we have that package created. And the package is going to be com. Um, usually it's com because it stands for commercial. Um, if you're building a project that it's for um, open source, it will usually start with org or org. Um, so in this case, um, <coughs> we're going to be building for commercial purposes. So so it's going to be com dot and then some kind of name that identifies it the project. So it's Timex Auto Web. And then I'm going to call this package the domain. This is where all the um, entity classes and their managers will be living in this project. So finish, and that's it. What other packages do you know that we're going to be creating? Let's create them right away. Um, com timex auto web dot util. This is where all the utility classes are going to live. You know, util classes like um, Hibernate Util, and, and we're going to see others, other classes that we're going to need later on uh, when we start uh, working with Spring. And then finally, for now at least, com timex auto web dot um, test because this is the one that it's going to have the hibernate test the one class that is going to test whether we got all our hibernate mappings working all right so now we're ready to switch to the hibernate perspective and then we're going to create the Hibernate configuration for this project. This Hibernate configuration will live out of the root of the source. So we're going to leave it at SRC. Okay, It's going to be called Hibernate.CFG.XML by default. That's the convention. You can always change it, but then the more you change, the more you're going to have to configure. So next. So at this point, we're going to say yes. Let's create a console configuration for this Hibernate configuration. We haven't. This is something that we we um, we bump into last week, and we spent a few minutes trying to figure out what you know w which one was first. Was it the console or the configuration? Well, when you create the configuration, you can create also the console right away. All right. So the database dialect, there's a whole bunch of database dialects. MySQL is the one that we're going to be using. OK. That's like the plain vanilla dialect. And then the driver class typically is the class that comes from that MySQL um, jar that we have included in our path, and it's typically the com MySQL JDBC driver. The connection URL, we're going to do a connection of this type. So it's going to be JDBC, uh, Java, which stands for Java Database Connectivity of the MySQL type. The host. The host is going to be localhost because we're going to be running it locally. By the way, do I have it running? Yeah, there is my SQL running, so I have it running locally. Um, by default, the port is 3306. 
that's for MySQL. And then the database, it's going to be Timex. In your case, it will be whatever your database is called. Uh, the username is root. Okay. And I'm not going to put any password. And I'm going to create the console configuration. Next. All right, so it's going to create a Hibernate console configuration. This is the project, Timex Auto Web. The database connection, it's going to be Hibernate Configure Connection. No property files, it's going to be core. Database dialect, didn't we do this already? MySQL. Um, class path, the default class path, or the Timex Auto Web. Hmm. This is the class path to the project. Mappings. We don't have the mappings yet. That's something that we're we're going to configure later on. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Then the name it, the name of this Hibernate console is going to be Timex Auto Web um, Console Config. Okay, so we're going to do finish, and this is what it generated. It generated a Hibernate configuration with this driver class, this URL, this username, and this dialect. This is by no means um, a complete Hibernate configuration. And we're going to see later on that we're going to have to add a few more things manually. And that's okay. Um, because at the point when we created it, uh, we didn't have all the information that we're going to need. <coughs> all right. So now that we have our configuration, Hibernate configuration set, what we're going to do is we're going to create our XML mappings. Right? The XML mappings are the ones that will use the Hibernate configuration to connect to the database, figure out what tables are out there, and then do a one run one to one relationship between the classes and the tables. Uh, so do we have do we have classes? No we don't. We don't have classes yet. So before we can do the hibernate mappings, we need to have those classes. Right? And if we do add classes, it's going to say, okay, which class do you want me to? It's all eager. Wh which classes are you going to want me to include? Well, we don't have classes yet. So, okay, so we cannot do the hibernate mappings. So now we're going to have to do what? Reverse engineering. Not that one. The actual reverse engineering. Yeah. I put class equal and then I specify the class that I want to be mapped or reverse engineer to, not mapped, but reverse engineer to, and, um, and I did that through the table. So it was not really it was not really a class attribute per se. But additional attributes called table. And by the way, this is even though the wizards are not fully complete in the sense that they don't give you the freedom to generate everything that you want. But the DTD, remember, you guys remember CSIS 3020 Web Programming and Design, there's something called a dic data dictionary. In this case, JBoss developers 
create a DTD for a hibernate reverse engineer. So if you open that file, let me try it again. And let's save it. If you open it with a an editor and take a look at it as take a look at it as a, an XML. Yeah, sort of. Notice that this DTD tells you exactly what is a Hibernate reverse engineer. So it says there's a tag call reverse engineer, and these are the elements, type mapping, and there's a precision, a length, a JDBC type. Uh, these are all the Hibernate types, and pretty much it defines the language of what it's expecting here. Okay, that's how I know that there is something called a table tag, where we define the catalog, the name of the, the the table, and the class that it will get mapped to. Okay, so to recap, we have created the Hibernate configuration. In creating the Hibernate configuration, we have also created the console configuration, which allows us to communicate with our database. We have also created the reverse engineer, but we have modified manually that part because I don't want plural class Java classes. I want singular Java classes. That's it. That's all we've done so far. Okay. So how about if we run our reverse engineer, right? Now we want to be able to run our reverse engineer. You guys remember how we did that? We went into our Hibernate code generation configurations, right? And I'm going to get rid of all these. I'm going to create a new one. Okay. I am going to create a new code generation configuration. And this is going to be called the um, Timex Auto Web. Um, code generation configuration. Okay? And then I'm going to be using what kind of console configuration I'm going to be using? I'm going to be using the Timex Auto Web console configuration. Now I'm going to be doing my reverse engineering from JDBC connection. Okay? So in doing it from the JDBC connection, I'm going to specify <coughs> uh, the package where I'm going to be putting it. So what's the package I'm going to be putting it? Com Timex Auto Web dot domain, right? And who is going to be doing the reverse or where is the reverse engineering setup? So use an existing one. And I'm going to point to that one, the hibernated reverse engineering that I created earlier. And the reverse engineering strategy, we're going to leave it blank. Now, it's going to try to detect the one-to-one -one associations and the many-to-many -many table associations and all that stuff. Now, so let's take a break for a second. And let's go back to the database. Because many of you asked me this question on Moodle and on the forums as well, which by the way, forums have turned out to be a really good source 
for the students. Because if anybody has a problem, post it on the forum. Maybe another student has solved it. Maybe they can solve it and they can post it on the forum so that other students can benefit. So it's a really, a really good thing. It's a win-win situation. Now, if you go and look at time make time sheets, for instance, and edit the table. And this is something that I've been asked er several times. Yes, on the first version of the database, I never defined foreign keys. I just defined the primary keys and let Hibernate manage the, the associations. But now, since we're trying to do it as, auto as automatically or as you know, much automatically as possible, um, we're going to define not only the primary keys of the table, which typically they are called ID for short, but also the foreign keys. Okay? So make sure that you define the foreign keys. So in this case, timesheets, for instance, timesheet has two foreign keys. One is to the employee table or employees table through the employee ID column because that's the employee that owns that timesheet and also to the department I, uh to the department's table through the department ID column because that's going to be the department where the timesheet gets charged to so make sure you define the foreign keys okay and i have also modified all of them so that on deleted cascades and on updated cascades as well and as you can see that's all defined in the database. Okay, so given that, then we are saying yes, detect the one-to-one -one associations, please, and detect the many-to-many -many associations. Um, we're not going to use any custom templates. So let's go into the exporters. So what are the exporters? The exporters are going to be the domain code, those are the entities, right? We also want to create the hibernate mappings. Those are the ones, those, those are the XMLs that map the classes to the tables and the properties and their field and their columns. And also the DAO code. This is the one that generates the CRUDs, the managers which have the CRUDs for each one of the entities. Okay, and that's it. At this point, that's all we need. So we apply, and as soon as we apply, it creates that Timex Auto Web code generation configuration. Okay, so what am I missing? What am I missing? Oh, the output directory. The output directory, if the run button is not enabled, you're missing something. Trust me. So the output directory uh, is going to be, I wonder if it should be source or all the way down to domain. Let's do all the way down to domain. Okay, so we apply it and then we run it. It's thinking. It's doing something. Domain code, hibernate mappings, DAO code, there it is. All right, so Timex Auto Web, under that package, it created department, department home, employee, employee home, etc. And then it created the department hybrid and mapping. You know, these are the ones that actually map all the properties of the classes to the columns in the tables. So my ID is a primary key, it's an integer, it's a generator, 
class identity. Name and state. What are the relationship with timesheets? Uh, the, the relationship with timesheet is a one to many. And the way that you should read it is one department can have many timesheets. Same thing with timesheets. If you take a look at the hibernate mappings, you know, these are the associations. It has a many to one relationship to employees. What does that mean? That many timesheets can belong to one employee. And a many to one with the department, which means many timesheets can be created for one department. All right. So given that, how do we test this stuff? Hibernate test. So I'm not going to write it from scratch, obviously, because that will be a waste of time. But you guys have to create your own Hibernate test. You can use mine as the model. But I'm going to copy and paste the Hibernate test pr from a previous project. Okay. And I'm going to open it. Here it is. So I'm going to resolve my imports, right? You all know how to do that. We right click on it, source, organize imports. And there it is. All the errors and all the comp compilation errors are gone. Save it. And then let's analyze for a second what we're doing here. It's a class called Hibernate Test that has the main, the well known point of entry of a standalone Java application, which means this will run independent of Hibernate and independent of Spring and independent of any other class in this project. Okay? It's like its own little program, if you will. What does it do? Well, it calls the Hibernate configuration class. And, and when you call a class like this, and you want to see what it looks like. Let me see if this is going to work or not. You just double click on the class and then you hit F3, which F3 also stands for um, Open Declaration. Right? And then it's going to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't know where that class is. I have no idea. I'm trying to figure out what it looks like. This is what I have. And it's really cryptic if you look at it, you know. It's actually going through the bytecode. So it found that class to be on this package of this jar, Hibernate 3. But it's it's compile code. You don't want that. You actually want to attach the source if possible. Why? Because with the source, when you attach the source, even if jars that you don't care about compiling, but if you attach the source, then you can actually see the Java that it's running behind the scenes. Okay? And understand much better the framework. So that's exactly what I'm about to do. I'm going to attach the source of the configuration class. In fact, I'm going to attach the source of the entire Hibernate framework. How do I do that? Well, you have to download the source code. And you can Google it, probably find it under JBoss. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to attach it to an external file. 
Where is that external file? External file is under C drive, hibernate, this, sources. And then you hit OK. And there you go. There is the source code for the configuration class. Now it's not cryptic bytecode. Now it's the real deal. This is the source code of the configuration class for Hibernate. So going back to our Hibernate test. Now when we attach the source code, notice what we can do now. We can hove over the configuration class and actually take a look at the documentation for that um, for that method class or whatever so what are we doing here we're actually initiating a new session factory and we need that and remember to be able to ask hibernate to do something for us we need to open a session it's a session that will connect our code to the database behind the scenes and that session must be open all the time that we want to query the database okay so that's why we are telling the configuration class to please configure okay so it's going to use the mappings and properties specified under the Hibernate CFG XML, right? The one that we generated. And this is going back to to convention over configuration. What if we would have we would have not called the configuration the Hibernate configuration file Hibernate.cfg.xml? Then we will have to come in here and pass as a parameter the name our of our configuration file of our hibernate configuration file which would have created a lot more headache for us but since we kept the default which is hibernate.cfg.xml then we can use config with no parameters and then what are we asking we're asking to build a session factory this is the this is the actual class or the method that is going to give us a factory to build sessions against the database what do we call it the session factory and then what do we do in this main we open a session and we're going to save this session all throughout the transactions that we're going to be doing in our hibernate test so tell me what kind of transactions we're about to do well the first one is getting a single record a single department so this is wrong this is type timex auto web right domain department and I'm trying to get department number four so if you guys look at the database department number four is information technology and then I'm going to print the name of that department second test I'm getting all the departments as a list and I'm going through the list one by one creating a department variable with each one and then I'm going to be printing the name and the ID right and in fact I'm going to put from and then I'm going to include the state as well because now we have states as part of the department. How do we know? Let's just type department dot and notice that it gets there's a get name, get state, and get ID. So we have a getter and a setter for every single one of the columns. So I'm going to do the get state. Print it out. That's it. What is the third test that we're going to be doing? From timesheet, where status code equals question mark. And we're going to be passing a parameter. Ah, 
what is the parameter, the status code of the timesheet? So what is the status code of the timesheet? If we go back and look at the table, the status code is a character. So we're good. Okay. So we're setting the parameter as a character, the parameters of zero, that's the first one, to the status code, this status code, P, which stands for pending. So, and it's going to give me a whole list. So that's the third test. I'm getting all the timesheets that are pending. And then I'm going to traverse through the list, and I'm going to be putting the uh, name of the employee. Look at this, timesheet. Give me the employee that owns it. Give me the name. So we're going to put the name of the employee that owns it and the timesheet period ending date. And then finally, what's going to be the last test that we're going to be doing for now? It's going to be getting a specific timesheet. So this is similar to the specific department, except that in here, we're doing a get, and we're passing a fully qualified class with a primary key, while in here, we're doing a get, but we're actually passing the class with the primary key. So there are two different ways that we can do this, okay? And as you can see, the IntelliSense automatically detects which one you're doing. In this case, it knows that I'm passing the class. Well, in this case, it knows that I'm passing a string with the entity name. All right. So that's about it. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to comment out the fifth test. We're not going to get involved in that one yet. We're going to save it. Okay, And then at the end, what do we do? We do a transaction commit. We close the session and then we close the session factory. So pretty much all these four tests will run under the same session. Let's run it. Run as a Java application. So let's take a look at what... Oh man. This is something that it really sucks about the wizard, you know? How come it was not able to... I told it where the package that it was going to be put on. How come it never put the package... That's really bad. Okay, so... The package... It's going to be... And this is one way that I'm going to, oh yeah, I'm going to do a global replace here. So this is how I do a global replace. I do control H, which stands for search. And I can do not a Java search, but a file search. And I'm going to look for every, every single file, pretty much, that has slash slash default package. Okay and I'm going to replace it. So it's going to go and look for all the classes that have the full package. I have a lot of projects, that's why it's going through a lot of stuff. And it's going through all the files, by the way, so... It's quite a lot. Okay. So it found... Timex AutoWeb. It also found some under Timex Hibernate webs, which we're not going to touch those. Not going to touch those. Okay, and what do we want to replace it with? We want to replace it with this package, com timings on our web, domain, domain, semicolon. Okay? So instead of doing OK and it will do it on all of them, we're going to do a preview. You can actually preview 
all the changes that it's going to do, where they're going to be done, the previous original source, and then the refactor or after applying the replacement, what it will look like. And you can select the ones that you want and deselect the ones that you don't want. So we don't want anything that has to do with Hibernate Web. No Hibernate Web. We're just going to do them on Timex Auto Web. Timex Auto Web. Timex Auto Web. There you go. Click OK. And now we get all our entities and managers with the correct package. So now let's do a project clean. Project clean. Yep, that one. And now we don't get any errors at all. If we go into our problems, it will say no problems, just warnings. Ignore the warnings. Got it? So now we're ready to run our Hibernate test. So you go back to our Hibernate test, right click on it, run as Java application. First thing that it does is, wait a minute. What do you mean org hibernate configuration environment? No appenders. You guys remember what this what this means? Log for J. You guys remember what this means? It means hibernate uses log for J. It's trying to log, but it can't do this because you're missing something. You're missing the log for J properties. Okay, that's a file that Log4j framework, which is the logging framework, uses to know how to log stuff. Very well, so let's go into one of those projects. I'm not going to create it from scratch. I'm just going to copy it, put it in the project. Okay. And then let's try it again. Hibernate test. Run as okay, hold on a second. Let's let's take a look at the log for J properties. I want to log absolutely everything. And and this is from log absolutely nothing off or just the fatal errors, or just the errors, or warnings. I mean, you know, these are the hierarchical values. So if you want all, everything that is being logged will be put into the console. That's the standard out, right? And you can optionally also put it in log file, but we're not going to do that. So at this point, we know that everything will be logged. All right? So let's try it. Hibernate test, run as Java application. Okay, error. What's the error? Unknown entity, Timex Auto Web Domain Department. Where are you getting that from? from hibernate test line 24 so you cannot find that okay the session cannot find that where does the session get these from this is a hibernate session right where does the hibernate session get this from? From the hibernate configuration, right? 
So let's open the Hibernate configuration. Does the Hibernate configuration tell the session anything about something like this? Look at it. Does it? Not at all. We're missing something. We're missing telling the Hibernate configuration, hey, by the way, I'm using mappings here, and this is where you will find them. So I'm going to copy and paste that stuff. from a previous one and say, okay, these are the mappings that I will be using. Okay? Except that it's not really Timex Hibernate Web. So that's not the real thing. It's Timex um, Auto web. All right. We save it, and we're going back to our Hibernate test. We're getting there. We're going to run it again. Run as a Java application. Oh, now we're getting a different error. Entity class not found department. Okay. Entity class not found department. By the way, it's still not finding the log or the hibernate. Com you know why? Does anybody know why? Still not finding the the appenders to log. Yeah, we created the log for J file. You see where we put it? We put it in here, not in the source. Source is a special kind of folder if you think about it. Because if you go into the build path and take a look at the configure build path, the source is where all the code and configuration files will, will live. So that's the first folder that Java will look for it under SRC. Okay? And we didn't put it there. So it's not finding it. So I'm going to move it there. So now I should find it. But that's not our error. Our error says or hibernate mapping exception entity class not found department. And and now it's having problems where? On Hibernate test line seventeen. So it's in the actual building of the session. So we're still dealing with <coughs> excuse me, we're still dealing with problems with our configuration, obviously. Entity class not found department. So let's take a look at our configuration. says, okay, there's something called a department hibernate XML. Let's take a look at the department hibernate XML. Ah, here it is. The name of the class is not fully qualified. I think that's what it was for the previous one. Yeah. It had to be fully qualified. So, I don't know why the wizard didn't do this, honestly. That's another thing that it should have been done by the wizard. It didn't do it. We specifically told the wizard where the package was going to be building. But, it's not perfect. Okay. All right. Com... Timex auto web dot domain. Okay. 
and I'm going to have to do the same thing for the employee oh and by the way for all the classes that represent a relationship I have to do it as well so might as well do it now class employee class timesheet I think department has one here and payment does payment have one yeah payment itself and timesheet and finally timesheet timesheet employee department everywhere you see class must be fully qualified payment save it and now we can go back to hibernate test and try it again so I'm going to clear this out right click on hibernate test run as Java application all right now we're cranking look at this stuff look at all everything that was logged this is pretty much the configuration loading all the hibernate configuration loading everything the one to many relationships blah 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 all that stuff then it went into the MySQL connector, you know, the um, the Hibernate configuration configurations. And then, look at this. It created, this is our first, this is our first test. Select ID from Timex departments where ID equals question mark. And then it creates this select and it passes the number four. Somewhere in here is going to be a number four. Or replace in the query a number four because that's the one that we're, we're trying to get. Oh, that's weird. I don't see it. Okay. And then, right here, this is our first. It's actually further down. Here it is. Building 4 to parameter 1. This is where it's binding the actual value 4 to the first parameter and it's doing this it's pretty cool because if you look at all the at, at, at the all the logins it's a lot of information and this is where it actually prints out this is all we were looking for in the first test name for IT equals information technology that's the result of our first test and this is the result of our second test, if you guys remember. Row 1, accounting from Florida. Row 2, customer support from Georgia, etc., etc. And then this is the result of our third test. Row is Theresa Walker is the owner of, I don't know, the timesheet that peer ending date is that. Okay. And then the, our last test is right here. Timesheet ID equals one is from a J Kumar for a peer ending date that. So sometimes it's useful to have the login turn on at all, and sometimes it's annoying because you're getting a bunch of stuff that you're not interested in. But the good thing is you can always adjust it, right? So let's say we're going to adjust the logging to just give me the 
informational stuff. Okay, so you change the root logger to be just info, save it, then go back to your Hibernate test and run it again as a Java application. Beautiful. This is what you get. Much, much less. So what is it? It's telling you the Hibernate, the mappings, it's loading the session, the configuration, and then all the way at the end is the result of our tests. Right here. Okay? Now, this is pretty much what we got last week in that two and a half right in that two hour and a half video lecture that the audio was out of sync and I really apologize to the students for that um, I guess it was just too long um, but this pretty much summarizes what you have to do once you have a well normal form a well normal form database with some data that helps and you want to generate a web application that queries that database but in an object oriented world this is it this is how you do it you use an object relational mapper that maps all the tables to entities it gives you the cruds the create reads and updates for for your um, database and uh, you create a test that's it thing before I finish this one. Remember that fifth test that we were trying to do? That fifth test was not using the session that was created by our main. It's actually going to use Hibernate Util. So I'm going to copy the Hibernate Util one or two weeks ago what the Hibernate Util is. Hibernate Util is a class that implements the singleton pattern which means this class will create one and only one session factory for the entire project. And that's a good thing, because we don't want every single manager to have its own session factory like this main does. This main, that's what it's doing. This main has its own session factory to open and close sessions. We want the whole project to be having the same session factory. The reason being... If we have more than one session factory, we could be opening um, sessions, doing transactions that will um, conflict within the same project. It will conflict. Those sessions will conflict with the transactions being done against the database. So there could be some synchronization problems. You could be doing, you know, a lot of wrong stuff. Plus, it will consume a lot of resources as well because every single manager will try to open a session factory and 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 a session in its that in its own session factory, and it will just consume all the resources of the server. Not a good thing. So we want just one session factory to be. Um, available for the entire project. So given that, going back to our Hibernate test, okay, if we resolve our imports, we're telling Hibernate Util to get the session factory and open a session for us, right here in main. And then we're t telling the employee home, remember that's the manager for the employees, we're telling it to find by ID the employee number two. 
and then we're printing out that employee. So if we try running that, it's not going to work. It says cannot locate session factory. And in fact, notice that it created the first session factory. It did our four tasks successfully and then it closed the session factory and then it opened a new session factory which we told it to notice that it went through all the configuration all over again okay and then when it came the time for employee home to use that session it says I'm sorry, but I can't I cannot locate the session factory. It's gone. So basically what happened was the session factory that was created here is no longer available in employee home. So let's take a look at find by ID what it looks like. See this? Find by ID has its own session factory. Where is this session factory coming from? Oh, it's building its own session factory. So we don't want that. We don't want every manager, and this is another thing that was created automatically by um, by the wizard. Every single manager has its own session factory created. not a good thing. What we want to do is we want to be able to reuse the session factory from Hibernate Util. So we're going to get rid of this and then the get session factory will get it from our Hibernate. So pretty much we're going to do this. Hibernate Util. Dot. Get Session Factory. Okay. And then all these calls to the local session factory, we're just going to replace them with get session factory. So we're going to do a fine of that, and we're going to replace it with that, replace all. Okay, so we pretty much replaced all the local session factory to the get session factory from Hibernate. So we're going to try our Hibernate test again. And now look what it happens. Now we get a different error message. It says, no current session context configured. It's like, what do you mean it's not? Where, where, where is it failing? So we go into employee home, that's a manager, line 91. And it's right here. Saying, OK, get the session factory, get the current session. But it says, no current session context configured. But there is one created by Hibernate Util. Well, the problem is the set the um, session factor is not being cached, and that's something that um, it's different in our Hibernate configuration from that was generated by the by the um, 
by the wizards. So if we go back to our Hibernate configuration, we're missing a few properties here. Okay? And the properties that we're missing, and I'm going to cheat here with this one, we're pretty much missing this one. The one that says current session context class is threaded and it should be cached. Okay, so let's put those two properties as part of the configuration. Okay, which by the way, I noticed that it also appended the hibernate dot. Huh? We'll keep it that way. It doesn't really need to put the hibernate dot. But uh, let's try it again. So we're going to run the hibernate test. Huh. Now we get a different error message. Get is not valid without an active transaction. So we're missing the transaction. <laughs> that was something that was done here in main, remember? You open the session and you begin the transaction. So I'm going to cheat for a second and I'm going to create and that's all in the if you guys go to find by ID from our employee manager here it is we actually have we actually have to begin the transaction so we're gonna have to create a session Oh man, this is a lot of stuff. See, this is where some of the students said, you know what, I don't see any benefit in the CRUDs being generated automatically for me because I have to do a lot of manipulation here. So we're going to do it. We're going to tell the Hibernate Util to get the session factory, get the current session, put it in here. Then we're going to tell the session to begin the transaction. Right? then once that's done we have to commit the transaction okay and then if something goes wrong we actually have to roll back the transaction so as part of the catch runtime exception we have to say session get transaction rollback and we have to do that, those changes for every single one of the CRUDs. So for find by ID, which is a read, for merge, which is an update, for delete, which is a delete, for uh, persist, which is a create, you know, for all those, you will have to do the same changes that I just did for find by ID. So that you can actually run hibernate test and still doesn't work <laughs> oh yeah unknown entity employee sorry about that yeah um, um, I have to fully qualify remember we have to fully qualify so it's calm that timex auto web dot domain dot employee. Remember when we pass the full string we have to fully qualify. Sorry about that. <coughs> so going back to our hibernate test. Let's run it once again. Hopefully this time will work. And indeed, it works. Here it is. Employee ID 
equals two with name AJ Kumar and username one two three whatever whatever whatever. But notice to use the employee manager, it created its own session factory. In fact, it went ahead and loaded the entire Hibernate configuration all over again. We had to cache the session, I mean the session factory, so it created a session so that the employee manager could use it, call the find by ID, and then be able to generate this. The long story short is Spring will take care of that for us. So that's the end of the ORM. I'm going to cut this video right now. And this is exactly what we were last week. And then I'm going to take this project and I'm going to add Spring to it. And we're going to see how Spring is going to manage our Hibernate sessions so that we don't have to do this what we just did for a single one of the uh, managers.